and on the on the fringes application we we made for that was the fact that sometimes we have folks in our churches they they're they're not really all that active or that involved in some of the stuff that's going on in the church but yet they're good at one thing and that's complaining and uh, sometimes that takes place and it's uh, those are situations that are tough to deal with I was a pastor for a lot of years pastor Dave's been pastor for a lot of years and those are difficult things to deal with and uh, <clears throat> sometimes we just got to face them head on and and sometimes we just have to say, you know, if you'd come more, you'd, you'd see what, what goes on. And a lot of times people don't get it. I remember several, a, a lot of years ago when I was um, a young serviceman before I got married and was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia and was hooked up with the little Baptist church there. And we had, in, has, a, has a forerunner, has a prelude, so to speak, to some special meetings that we're having with missionaries and Bible teachers. We spent a whole week in prayer. And uh, um, come Friday night, uh, we had this one serviceman who was, who was good at complaining, and he would just hop from church to church in the Norfolk, Virginia area, and, and he'd go until something bothered him, and then he'd go to another church. Well, he showed up on Friday night, and we had a wonderful time of prayer. And so we finished up, and the pastor says, any, any questions or comments? And, and this young serviceman raised his hands, and he says, I didn't see any repentance here tonight. Well, what do you mean? And he says, well, when Job went to the Lord, Job says, I repent in dust and ashes. And I'm thinking, okay, how's the pastor going to handle this? And then all of a sudden, Pastor Schwartz said, uh, young man, is this your first night here this week? Yes, it is. Pastor said, you should have been here Monday night. That's when we did that. See, that's, we, that's what we started out with. We said we didn't go into all of the repent with dust and ashes, but he says in our heart. We just really wanted to make our, our hearts and minds and souls clean before the Lord to, so we could spend some good time in prayer. And that's one of the things I'm talking about out there on the fringes. And people, you know, take just kind of take pot shots. <clears throat> and so, and then there were those who were from what we call the, the rabble, what the scripture calls the rabble. And these were people, and these people were not... Uh, they were non-Israelites. They were those who had uh, given their allegiance to the, the uh, requirements for putting the blood on the side of the doorpost and the top of it to get, out of, to get out of Egypt. But as far as a real heart for the Lord, they did not have that. And sometimes, and I liken this to, sometimes we have folks in the church, and even some of those folks are, are members, and but they 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 just constantly stir up trouble. They constantly stir, stir up trouble, and they'll get you aside. Um, I always, I'm always on my guard. In a congregation, especially as a pastor, when when someone, male or female, when you're out of the way and, and they come up to you and they. They look around and they, and they say, can I talk to you for a minute? And it's over to the side and I think, okay, which way is this going to go? And by and large, most of the time it's, you know, do you know, have you heard about so-and-so? You ever heard about so-and-so? And in my early days of ministry, sometimes I would listen to that. But anymore I just say, Hold on, let me ask you a question. Have you gone and talked with so-and-so? Well, no, I haven't, but you, and I says, we're done here. Scripture says you, if you have a, a little moan or groan or complaint, you're supposed to go to them and talk to them. So what, you're not interested? And I said, well, 
not the way this is going, I'm not. And those are hard calls to make, aren't they? They're just, you know, and sometimes I walk away and I thought, God, I bet that person will never come back to church again. But yet, I take consolation in the fact that that's the way the scripture teaches we're supposed to handle stuff. And so, uh, and sometimes people don't realize, and it can be a good teaching moment if it's, if it's handled correctly, and sometimes people will respond to that kind of uh, calling them up short, I guess you would call it, and sometimes they don't. And then <coughs> I mentioned last week that in conjunction with uh, verse 6 of chapter 11, it says we've lost our appetite, and they wanted to be back in, in uh, Egypt where they had the, the eight, uh, we had meat to eat, we had fish we ate in G Egypt at no cost, all the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic, but it says now we've lost our appetite, we never see anything but this manna. And Nancy brought some manna this morning, so if you want to, after the, after the meeting, if you want to taste a taste of manna, we don't know just exactly all of the, the scripture doesn't give a recipe for that. But it says it, what it looked like and get an idea what it tasted like and stuff like that. And, and so, Nancy? Yeah, um, when I researched it, it's funny because I always had in my mind it was like the little white communion wafers that, that we get that kind of taste like styrofoam. And <clears throat> as I researched it, every, every site that I went to had the same basic <laughs> recipe for it. And it's nothing like I would have imagined. It's just made from sprouted wheat and a little bit of honey, and that's it. But it makes little, I just made it into little cake type things. So it, it's, like I say, different than I ever pictured it. She, she made, some, when I was doing some similar teaching uh, <coughs> from Exodus, with the, some of the guy or the guys at the mission, Nancy made some manna, uh, same stuff that she has here today. And it was interesting when the guys sampled it, and then I asked them what it tasted like. And it was interesting to discover that just about every one of them, it tasted different to every one of them. And so I think that's. You know, and, and I, I think that was kind of, if that was indeed the case with the children of Israel, that may have been what, what God wanted to do, see. And he fed them that way for, for they ate manna. God provided manna all the time they were in the wilderness. And then when they got in the promised land, then they, they, the scripture says they ate the produce. They ate the fruit of the land, and they no longer, some, some probably still... <coughs> would eat the manna if they had enjoyed it, if they weren't sick of it by then, but it wasn't part of their uh, required or daily diet. So <clears throat> let's look over now to what is basically the third, the third page there, the complaining from Moses himself. I want you to pay attention to this, please, um, and, and as, we, as we look at it, because this is some very important stuff that's contained here. <clears throat> Let's look at it first of all, verses 10 through uh, 15 here in um, Numbers chapter 11. Moses heard the people of every family wailing, each at the entrance to his tent. So get the picture <clears throat> of this. They, they, they are camped there and the people says they every family Moses heard the people of every family wailing each at the entrance to his tent so they're kind of at the uh, let's look at it as the doorway at their house and they're just standing out there and they're just moaning and groaning complaining and Moses is hearing all this and the Lord became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled God was angry because 
of the fact that the people once again were complaining. And Moses was troubled because he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to do. So he asked the Lord. Now, listen to this. Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath, on oath to their forefathers? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, put me to death right now. If I have found favor in your eyes and do not let me face my own ruin. Pretty bold words. You ever felt like that? I asked the pastor the question, you ever felt like that? Did you see this? Have I felt like that? Yep. Yep. I think every leader, uh, whether they're a pastor or not, just in business or, or in corporations or whatever, uh, reach a point when they think, good grief. People are moaning and groaning and complaining. And so to emphasize the second paragraph there, well, Moses, let me say this first of all. Look at your notes. Moses didn't complain about the same thing the Israelites complained about. He was not lusting for meat or complaining about the manna. Rather, Moses complained about his job. He complained that his duty was more than he could do. It is too heavy for me, he says in verse 14. And then to emphasize the fact, like we just read, that the job was too heavy for him, Moses piles up some self-pitying descriptions of his job that did not, like Ruthie just said, speak well of God. He accused God of being mean to him. Why have you brought this trouble on me? He accused God of not loving him. What have I done to displease you? He accused God of being unfair to him. Did I give birth to all these people? And of course, none, here's the important thing. None of what Moses said was true. It was simply the complaint of the despondent soul, Moses, who when faced with difficulty, wilted under the problem and sought to blame God for the problem. We all get that way, don't we? We just, uh, it sometimes life becomes too heavy to bear. And pastors, uh, church leaders, husbands, wives, even kids, the suicide rate in the United States is an, at an all-time high, okay? I sit down and talk with guys at the mission. And one of the first things I do when they come into the program, I get with them and I said, okay, tell me from the age of 16 how you got to this point in your life. And it's absolutely amazing and I don't think we should be surprised. I'm amazed, but thinking about it now, I'm not all that surprised when they share that many of them either tried to or comp contemplated suicide. Suicide. And uh, it's a tough, tough where they just, no hope. No hope. I had a fellow this week in the in the program, he's, he's got a, a, a daughter who um, was raped. The fellow who did it was caught, charged, he's now in prison, but this daughter still has some scars. And um, because of his alcohol and drug use, he lost his family, lost his business. Now he's part of the program. And this stuff with his daughter, uh, 
is just kind of overwhelming. And one of the guests showed up <coughs> the other night, offered him some heroin, and he took it. And fortunately for him, he didn't take a whole lot. And he's still in the program. But he's just kind of been set back a little bit and uh, has showed some remorse and repented and stuff like that. But uh, uh, I talked to him just briefly on, uh, on Friday because he, he's still kind of recovering from that heroin dosage that he'd taken the night before. <coughs> And uh, can you tell me why you did it? And I said, if you don't want to talk about it now, that's okay. And he said, well, we'll I'll go into detail later. But he said, I just could not cope. I reached a spot where I was having a difficult time coping. And he says, Doing the heroin was what I used to do to cope. And he said, I, I went, when I was offered that by one of the guests that came in and for the night, and I, I did it. And that's basically all I've talked to him. I'll probably talk to him again a little bit more this week. But see, we reach a point sometimes when we, when we just want to throw up our hands. And so, like I, I want you to understand, and I think you, you realize this, that what I put here, what Moses said was not true. And that's, we, we need to remember that when we start complaining. We, we need to say, okay, how valid are our complaints? And when we really begin to look at them, they're not valid at all, see? And what it is, a lot of times, and we talked about this, Pastor talked about this on, uh, on Wednesday night in uh, his teaching on Satan. If you want to review that, it's, it's on our site. And take a look at that and, and uh, look at it and really see what, how the enemy works in our lives sometimes. And he just, like one of, the, one of the house managers, one of the guys who was in the program there at the mission, who's now on staff, is a house manager. One of the things he shared with me yesterday, he said, we had another messenger of the enemy come in to our house talking about the mission and dangled some of his stuff before one of our guys and one of our guys cashed in on it and uh, and that's what happens the enemy dangles all kinds of stuff in front of us but then we just need to we need to come to our senses and the quicker we come to our spiritual senses the better off we're going to be when we say Lord you take care of this you love me. I belong to you. And I don't know how many times down through the years I've done that. I've been, sometimes I've been forced to do it. Lord, you chose me and I belong to you. And help me to realize that the bottom line is taking care of this, it's not my problem. It's yours. See? And, uh, and, and God, will, God will step in. But he waits for us. He will not push himself on anyone. You got that? He, he doesn't like to do that. Sometimes he, he, he has to do that. We see, in the, we see that with the nation of Israel and uh, where he just had to reach down and straighten them up. But a lot of times God just wants us to say, Lord, help. And then he will come. It's like, all right. And he comes to our rescue. And I love that when he does that. I love that. And so, notice God's response. The Lord said to Moses, verse 16, 
Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there and I will take of the spirit that is on you and put the spirit on them and they will help you carry the burden of the people so that you will not have to carry it alone. What do you think went on in Moses' heart when God shared that with him? Wow. Wow. What a, what a relief. Isn't it great to have help in ministry? It is. And, and whether it's, it's uh, I mean, I, I, I have such a blessing. And it's such an honor for me to be in this spot where I can, I can come alongside Pastor Dave and he can come alongside me and we can minister together and, and just sharing these teachings and stuff like that with you. And what a blessing it is to have different ones of you kind of step up. Sure, do we get a, a, a certain uh, monetary thing from doing uh, doing what we're doing yes we do but see the important thing is we can't do it all you look at all the stuff that needs to take place in church ministry and a pastor and even an associate can't do it all all right all the stuff that's involved in ministry and um, I'd like to put in a plug for our business meeting that's coming up this, this Wednesday, where pastor's gonna share from his heart what he'd like to see accomplished in this, uh, where we are and what he'd like to see accomplished in this, in this ministry. We have a great ministry here. We got a, we got a lot of folks who just jump in and, and, and pinch hit. People who are, who are doing stuff that heretofore was out of their uh, they're, they're doing stuff that is not in necessarily in their comfort zone, see. But, but, the, but they're saying, okay, because it needs to be done, I want to step up and allow God and those around me to, to train me to do it. And see, that's what, that's what God just wants a, a willing heart. I think of Amos, Amos the prophet, when God called him. Amos said, I don't consider myself a prophet, prophet. I wasn't a prophet's kid, but God called me. Amos was a shepherd, and he said, God called me as I followed the flock. That's the, pas that's the passage of scripture that God gave me when I became pastor at First Church of Shelter Cove. And I remember sharing with Larry McCain and, and, and Gary Durbin when I met with those guys to, to kind of, they, they helped mentor me about pastors. Uh, um, I got a kick out of Larry McCain. He says, you, you are now, you're, you're a senior pastor. I said, I'm the only pastor. He said, well, yeah. He said, but you're the senior pastor out there at Shelter Cove. And so he shared with me some of the pastor stuff and then shared with me a lot of the neat stuff that was taking place within the Southern Baptist Convention. And so after that first meeting with them, when I really prayed and, and I was uh, just asking the Lord for guidance, as I read Amos, I thought, you know what? I wasn't a Southern Baptist. My daddy wasn't a Southern Baptist, but God called me just as I was ministering ministering to people God called me and said this is where I want you to serve and uh, served that congregation for over 20 years was it smooth sailing I wish it had been but I look back on some of those things and and they made me help make me what I what I am today and so uh, we're to the uh, reach the point where not a whole lot of stuff phases me Sometimes it drives my wife nuts. So don't you, aren't you concerned about anything? I said, well, yeah, I am. But we just learn by our experiences. And when we, when we have those experiences, we can learn by them. So God gives Moses 70 men to come alongside him. 
Some believe these were the same 70 guys that God, uh, that Moses, that God gave to Moses back uh, in the time when, remember when his father-in-law Jethro came to him? Uh, whether that was the case or not, I don't know. But at any reason, we have 70 men who step up. Now, no, I want you to notice three things about these 70 men. First of all, their selection, then their spirit, and then lastly, their, their speaking. First of all, their selection. Uh, Israel's, they were elders, leaders, officials. These 70 men were to be the cream of the crop of men in the Israelite congregation. And looking back when, uh, during the time there, that situation with Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, when, uh, when 70 men were picked, they were to be men who, who were leaders, men of good report, men who understood uh, the things of the Lord. And you, you come over into the New Testament when it talks about uh, elders serving and everything like that, the same qualifications are laid out. Elders and deacons. And, and so um, this, this is apropos. The, the leader, the elders, they were wise and experienced men. Tradition says that the elders that would serve in the congregation of the Israelites were men who were at least 50 years of age or older. So they were people who were wise in a lot of stuff and they were experienced as far as, you know, knowing the people and experience and stuff in life. Uh, leaders, in all likelihood, no one was selected who was not already in a capacity of leadership. It's not a good idea, especially in a church, to slap somebody in a position of, of prominent leadership that hasn't been tried. See, some people just want to jump in there and do that. Uh, it's disaster, and I'm speaking from 50 plus years of ministry, and pastor could say the same thing, and and it's just it's just not a good idea. Uh, took a little bit of heat from one of the men in the Shelter Cove Church because he he was always zeroing in. We got to have elders. We got to have elders. We got to have elders, and I said, we're not going to have elders in this church unless we have somebody who's qualified to do that. And for the most part, we didn't have anybody that was qualified. And, uh, and so, and some people would, and it usually was a wife who came to me and said, you know, my husband would make a good elder. I said, okay. I'd go to the husband and he'd say, I'd make a horrible elder. Let me tell you some of the stuff that's going on in my life based upon what you say you want as an elder, I don't measure up. And I'd say, well, can you convey that to your wife? And guess what he'd say? She's the one that came to you. You're the one that needs to go to her and tell her that I'm not qualified. I said, yeah, right. <coughs> so this just died again. No, it didn't. Are we good? We still okay? Okay. Sounded like it. <clears throat> so don't, well, not enough said. I, I, you know, some of this stuff I think I'm just kind of like preaching to the choir because you know this stuff, okay? And then officers. These were, these were guys who um, were kind of overseers. The companion in the New Testament to that is, again, an elder or a bishop or whatever, an overseer, an overseer. And these were, these were folks who also, it's believed, were kind of those who were scribes, who kind of uh, kept a record, kept a record. Uh, if you read the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, Moses lays out the history of what went on within the, Israelite camp as they're going through the wilderness. And some believe that some of these guys, these officials that were chosen, who were scribes as such, 
Moses, they, they, they helped Moses and they, and they would see what was going on and they wrote it down. They wrote it down. And of course, Moses, uh, I've often wondered, you look at all the stuff that's, that's uh, contained in what Moses shared in the book of Deuteronomy, I think, how do you have time to write all that stuff down? And so I thought this week, and in looking at this, that perhaps maybe some of those scribes did. And Moses, you know, just kind of went through that. Moses was learning all the wisdom of the Egyptians. So he, he, he was probably even um, a speed reader <laughs> and was able to go down. And, you know, that's, that's just kind of uh, speculation. But you get an idea that these guys were kind of not only overseers and helped in the leadership portion, but they were also writers or scribes. And then it says, and I will take of the spirit that is on you and put the spirit on them. Now, that doesn't mean that he took the spirit from Moses. I want you to understand that. The spirit God gave to Moses was not diminished. You got that? It was added to with the help of the 70 elders. And I got to thinking, you know, how am I going to explain this? How am I going to explain that statement? And this may be kind of a crude illustration, but this is what I came up with. It was like taking a lighted candle and lighting other candles. And doing this does not diminish the light of the original candle, but it multiplies the light of that original candle by the additional lighted candles. Does that make sense? And, and when, you, uh, when you have Moses, who is in context with this little illustration, when Moses, who is the lighted candle that God has put there, then all of a sudden these 70 elders come along and with their own candles. And, and it just kind of lights up the place. It, it, uh, it doesn't diminish the, the light that Moses had. It just simply increases it. So you have, you have better coverage. Moses is, is, is able to see stuff more clearly. And I'd like to think that those elders, especially in, in the light of the fact that they were wise and experienced, came alongside Moses and said, you know what, Moses? I, we understand what you're saying, but, it, but it's not true. God loves you. God loves you. And so do we. And sometimes that's what pastors and leaders in the church you know, people in the church, we need encouragement. There's one verse in, in the scriptures, I love it, in the Living Translation, it says, is there any such thing as one another in the body of Christ cheering others up? See, and sometimes we, we have a tendency not to speak well of people. Uh, it's human nature sometimes to spend more time in gossip than we do in glory. And just, just sharing the, the glory of the Lord that we see in people. That little song that somebody wrote a long time ago um, that, um, oh, I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. And I remember at the Weot Church where Lance Anderson was pastor for many years, we'd sing that song, and Lance said, okay, now this time we're going to sing it again, and as you sing it, turn around and look at somebody. We could look at somebody and and say, I, I can see in you the glory of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. And that's what God wants us to see in people, is the glory of the King. And, uh, and if we see that, let them know. Boy, I really see in you the glory of the King. And um, encourage, you realize what that can do to, to a person's spirit when they, when they hear a compliment like that? And uh, we try and do that. And uh, we try and, and when people step up, whether it's those who are cleaning the church or those who are helping with communion or the offering, we appreciate that. And it's a big deal to us. It really is. It's a big deal, you know. And uh, so the Lord, it's, it's good to be able to, to cheer one another up. Any questions or comments so far? Now let's look at what these elders did as far as their speaking. 
verse 25. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took of the spirit that was on him and put the spirit on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. And what's the next phrase? But they did not do so again. Some translation says, and they only did it temporarily. Now it would seem that the temporary prophesying of these 70 elders was primarily to establish their credentials as spirit-empowered leaders. A lot of times that's what God does. God will select a leader and then he will do something with that leader to verify the fact that they belong there as a leader. So the people can recognize that. See? You understand? Does that make sense? And he does that. He, he's done that down through, down through the years. And uh, he's, he still does it today. Now, before we wrap this up this morning, I, I want to go back and I want to make some comments on verses 18 to 23. In response to what the Israelites had said earlier, <coughs> that is, if only we had meat to eat, God let Moses know that these complainers were going to have plenty of meat to eat for a whole month. So much meat to eat that it was going to come out of their nostrils and they would loathe it. No, notice this. Tell the people, verse 18, Consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed, if only we had meat to eat. We were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat, and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day, or two days, or five, ten, or twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils, and you loathe it, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and have wailed before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? Now, when this takes place, when Moses gets this word from God, then Moses issues another complaint. Now, notice what he says. Moses says, Here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? Mm. Logical complaint from Moses? Kind of. But keep in mind, Moses was still, even though he had the elders to come alongside him, they probably had not really got involved with Moses in their ministry that God had called them to do. So Moses was still kind of in a complaining pattern at this point. And so when God says, I'm going to feed all these people, all of these people, over 600,000 of them, and those were just the men on foot, plus you got women and children. And and. Moses is thinking, where's all this, where's all this meat going to come from? Where's all this food going to come from? And I think Moses forgot, had forgotten the manna and the quail that had already been given. Moses forgot the water from the rock. So there were a lot of things that because of the fact that Moses was in a complaining mode, his mind and especially his heart was clouded and veiled. And so this is a, another thing where sometimes when, when we're faced with insurmountable stuff, we need to just step back and see what the Lord will do. Okay? And uh, 
The Lord answers him. The Lord answered Moses. Is the Lord's arm too short? You will now see whether or not what I say will come true for you. And God, in that statement, God really, I think, rebukes Moses. Is the Lord's arm too short? In other words, Moses, do you realize who I am? Sometimes that's what the way God comes. Do you realize who I am? And he says, now you're going to see. So in a much deserved rebuke, look at the last paragraph here. Moses got his answer about how the meat would be provided by God's power. God's power is never diminished, nor does he ever run out of power. He is as powerful now as he ever was. Amen? Amen? Amen. He does not get tired or faint and lose his strength. God could supply the meat just as he provided the manna and just as he provided all the other great needs for Israel. Moses had spoken poorly of God's power, and sometimes we do too, but God does not act poorly in the display of his power. In this case, God acted powerfully, decisively, and with the punishment that was deserved for those who complain. Now look over at the tail end of chapter 11 here at verse 31. Here's what God does. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It brought them down all around the camp to about three feet above the ground as far as a day's walk in any direction. About yay, John, huh? Three feet? In any direction. In any direction. All that day and night and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than ten homers. Hmm. Then... They spread them out all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth, and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people, and he struck them with a severe plague. Because of their complaining. Because of their complaining. Therefore the place was named Kebroth Hataba, because there they buried the people who had craved other food and that simply that means the the graves of the craving that's the meaning of that place that they called it there the graves of the complaining please please do not put yourself in a grave of complaining. Okay? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for these lessons. They're just as applicable to us today as they were way back then. The Apostle Paul said that the stuff that was written way back when was written for our instruction with a view to living holy and godly lives. So Lord, help us to take what we've heard and use it in our lives. I won't presume to say, Lord, this is the way you're going to use it in each person's life. All I ask is that each person who has heard this today would say, okay, how can what is here, how can I use it and apply it to my life so I can be a better believer, a better Christian, a better follower of Christ than I was when I walked in the door today? That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.